Hello, and welcome to the NFPA Link YouTube channel. This page is dedicated to answering key questions you have related to electrical and life safety. With easy to use digital access to NFPA codes and standards, NFPA Link is your window to productivity. Today we've been asked to review conduit fill using the 2023 National Electrical Code, or NEC as it's commonly referenced. So for my dashboard and link, I'm going to navigate to the 2023 NEC and open it up. And I initially want to jump down into the annexes. Now, if you're familiar with the, the code layout, um, chapters one through nine are enforceable parts of the code, but the annexes are there for more information uh, to help explain different things. There's, uh, you know, examples. Um, administration enforcement there's there's several things here um, that are covered within these annexes uh, but annex C is specific to conduit fill so this is a common place that people will go to and utilize um, when they initially start thinking about conduit fill on the job site or in their designs so the annex C tables are very helpful um, but the only thing about them is that you have to have all of the same size conductors in that conduit in order to truly utilize these tables. Um, if you have different size conductors, uh, which can be common, something as simple as pulling in a little bit smaller equipment ground conductor um, for a circuit, now puts you in a position where you have two different size or more conductors uh, within that conduit. And these tables don't apply in that case. Um, those would go back into the chapter nine tables, which we'll get to here in a minute. Uh, but these tables are helpful and there to utilize if you have all the same size conductors. Now, within Annex C, there are a multitude of tables and they're basically broken down into uh, conduit type. Okay, so these initial ones are dealing with electrical metallic tubing. So you've got table C1 and you also have table C1A that both deal with electrical metallic tubing or EMT as it's commonly referenced. So what's the difference between those and why the two tables? Well let's take a look. Table C1, the first one if we expand it, um, deals with conductors and this is going to be standard conductors and you'll see what I mean when we get to table C1A but let's take a look at this table in greater detail first. So you can see on the left hand side the first column we have is the wire type based on the insulation that's being utilized. Then we have conductor size and then we go into the trade size of the conduits. And you'll see if you're familiar with the 2020 NEC and prior uh, EMT conduit um, was only permitted to go up to the size 4 inch. And now you can see over here we have values in the five and six inch columns and that's because there was a change in the 2023 NEC that per now permits EMT to go up to a six inch trade size. Uh, so that's a change and you can see these tables have been modified to reflect that and incorporate those values. Okay, But this table, let's say we wanted to use a type RHW conduit or RHW wire I should say, uh, number 12 and we want to put it in a three quarter inch conduit. Well, we would go down here in that column to the number 12 row, and we can see if we're using the number 12 RHW, the maximum amount we could put in that three quarter inch conduit would be six of them, okay? But those are, again, all the same size, number 12 RHW is going in that conduit. All right, let's move down to the next table, table C1A that still deals with EMT and see what the difference is. And it's right up here at the top. With this table, you're dealing with compact conductors. So with the previous table C1, uh, we were dealing with just standard conductors. Now table C1A applies to compact conductors. Well, what's a compact conductor? If we scroll to the bottom here, there's a definition that we can look at. So compact stranding is the result of a manufacturing process where the stranded conductor is compressed to the extent that the interstices or voids between the strand wires are virtually eliminated. So if you look at the end of a, a piece of wire, uh, a 
bigger wire is probably a little more helpful or easier to see this. You can see that there's multiple wires within it that make up that larger overall wire. The manufacturers during this process compress that down and the airspace that's within those individual wires get compressed into that larger conductor. So essentially there's less space there within those wires to dissipate that heat because it's being compressed. But it also makes the wire a little bit smaller, in turn making it a compact conductor and usable within this table C1A. This is a common, uh, common mistake um, on exams and things of that nature to utilize the wrong table in this application. Uh, so it's very important when you get back into these uh, tables in Annex C that you're using the proper one for conduit type, first of all, and then know that whether you need to be in the table that's for standard conductors or if you're using compact conductors. And compact conductors, um, some of the more popular uh, aluminum wire that can be utilized for service entrance cables and things of that nature, uh, or service entrance conductors, um, utilize that compact uh, conductor. Um, manufacturing process. So it's just important to know what you have and what you're working with in order to use the proper tables. So the Annex C tables are here. They're great to utilize if you have the same size conductor. And these tables, the information that's within these tables are made up of the Chapter 9 tables that we're about to look at. Uh, Annex C just essentially is uh, you know, more of a kind of a cheat sheet or cliff notes um, so you don't have to go back and utilize the Chapter 9 tables if you have all the same size conductors. Um, so when you don't have the same size conductors, we're going to go back into chapter nine. And I want to look at table one first just to kind of give you a breakdown of what we're going to see moving forward. So table one gives you the cross-sectional area in percentage that can be filled based on the number of conductors or cables that are being uh, pulled within that conduit. So if we have one conductor, we can fill up to 53% of the area. Two conductors, 31%, and over two, we can go up to 40%. Now that over two is probably the most common um, application. Even if we have a, a single phase circuit that we're pulling an equipment ground with, we now have three wires, so we're over two. Uh, if we have a three phase circuit, we're already over two with just your, your initial conductors before we even start talking about ground wires or anything. So um, that 40% is, Going to be the typical area uh, where you're likely going to fall within the the conduit fill um, calculations that you're doing so if we move down into table four um, you'll see that uh, table one information that's utilized again but first of all table four is broken down into multiple smaller tables they're all references table four but the headers on them uh, apply to specific conduit types. So you need to make sure when you go into table four, you get into the proper conduit type. So for example, this first table is based on article 358, which covers EMT. Okay, and then when we go down um, to the next level and look at the column titles, we can see here's over two wires, 40%. So that comes from table one that we just looked at, as well as one wire, 53%, and two wires, 31%. And we also have the total area, 100% total area, um, for the particular conduit size. So if we look at uh, this row is three quarter inch conduit. Total area available is 0.533. If we know we have over two wires in a three quarter inch conduit, we move over here. 0.213 is 40% of 0.533. So it's already done the calculation for us in order to do that. So what's the 0.213 mean? It means we can take all our individual conductors sizes and they don't have to be the same size because we're going to pick them individually and then add them up together. Once we add all the conductor uh, areas together to get that total value, it would have to be less than 0.213 in order to utilize that three quarter inch conduit in that application. Or we would need to keep going up to the next area in inches squared to figure out what size conduit we would need to utilize. Okay, so where do we get the individual area in inches squared for each individual conductor? That's in the next table in chapter nine, which is table five. 
So moving into table five, we can see it looks pretty similar to some of the other tables we've looked at. You've got insulation type wire here first. We've got wire size. And then we go into approximate area, which is what we were dealing with in table four that we just looked at. And we were dealing with inches squared. So this is the column we're gonna wanna utilize to grab our values to total. So if we're gonna have a type RHW like we've been talking about, number 12, it would be 0 0.0353 is the value we would use for one number 12 RHW. If we have four of them, we would need to take that value four times, add it together, and come up with the total. Something to be conscientious about in table five uh, or any table for that matter, when there's a, where there's, where's there an asterisk, we just looked at the one in, in Annex C. Um, if you move down a ways here, you'll see there's another type RHW that has an asterisk next to it at the end, okay? And this is number 12 again, so we've got the same size uh, wire, but it gives us a different value, it's 0 0.0260. So it's a little bit smaller than it was in the one that we looked at above. So what is this asterisk about? If we go to the bottom of the table, it tells us types RHH, RHW, and RHW-2 without an outer covering. So with not having the outer covering for this specific type of insulation or, or type of wire, it makes it a little bit smaller. And that's why we have that smaller value with the asterisk. So, and that's going to make a difference, um, you know, in, in the field, in the design, um, you know, you have to know what you have so you can get the proper information from the table. Uh, if you're doing uh, calculations for, for an exam, uh, same thing. You want to make sure you get the right information. Um, so it's very important to keep an eye on that. But so what you're going to do is go through the insulation types, grab the values uh, in that area in inches squared column that we have here for whatever uh, wire sizes, insulation types, anything can kind of mix up there. And then you can uh, come up with a total. And then once you come up with that total, you're going to work back into the tables four. And you, just depending on what type of conduit you're going to utilize, let's say we're in this case, we came up with a total and we're going to use uh, rigid metal conduit or type RMC instead of EMT now. So we're going to open that. Depending on what our value is, uh, we're going to pick the proper size conduit. If we're less than 0.355, we can use this one inch conduit. If we go over that number, we would have to keep climbing up until we get to the proper size conduit that would work for the application. So we hope that provided some insight into conduit fill using the 2023 NEC. For more info on how NFPA Link gives you the knowledge you need to get the job done right, please visit www.nfpa.org forward slash link.